Hi, my name is Mia Ahungwango, and I'm interviewing Norma Cantu. Today is March 20th, and this is an interview for the Voices Are All History Project. Um, if at any time you wish, you wish to stop the tape to go to use the facilities or anything like that, please let me know, and we will do so. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started by asking you some questions. Okay. Um, so you grew up in Brownsville. Can you talk about what that was like? All right. So I grew up uh, on 15th Street. And Brownsville's first street is the Rio Grande River. So I grew up 14 blocks from Mexico. Um, my um, mom uh, was um, a housewife, and uh, my dad worked as a delivery man for the Hygieia Dairy. And what Brownsville was like back then in the 50s was it was post-war, very agricultural. Um, the, uh, the, the trucks would drive by in the morning to pick up the... the the pickers, the, the folk in the neighborhood who would jump on the truck and go, go grab cotton or whatever was growing in season. Uh, my mother kept us home. She did not want us to pick cotton the way she did as a child. And uh, my dad supported um, a growing family. Um, so Brownsville in the 50s was a lot smaller than it is now, much more uh, agricultural than it is now, and much, much poorer than it is now. So did your parents immigrate from Mexico? Was it their great-grandparents? Uh, we are, I am a fifth generation Texan. Uh, my great-grandfather was born in Texas, my grandfather born in Texas, and on, on down. Um, in fact, they were born in, in what were unincorporated areas, so that is outside of the cities, uh, in, on ranchos, in, on the U.S. side. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so. You went to school in Brownsville as well. Can you tell me about what that was like? I know you attended four different elementary schools. Well, I, I, I skipped school. So my mom um, was the first in her family to have a high school degree. And my grandfather valued education very highly. In fact, he, even though he was an alfabeto, which is illiterate, uh, he wanted all of his children to learn. So he told the elementary school teachers to send report cards color-coded red if they were doing poorly, blue if they were successful, and he would, he would either praise them or spank them depending upon what the color showed on the report cards. And my mother followed the same way. She wanted all of her kids uh, to do well in school. Um, she found out that she had a relative who ran a private uh, preschool, and one of the very, very rare ones, one of the few ones in the valley. Uh, so my mom w was able to get us enrolled part-time, and by us, my, my little brother, I was, I was six and he was five, and we both signed up for preschool. Uh, my mom wanted me to, to start first grade, but my birthday's not until November, mm -hmm. and the rule is that you had to already be six on, on the first day of September. So my mom took me to preschool, and my little brother jumped out of the car. And my mom says, where do you think you're going? And he says, I'm going with my sister. And so he, he and I went to preschool. That's the first school. Then Webb Elementary was the next public school. Um, that was a school built like a courtyard. It looked like an hacienda. And um, I, I, I showed up after one year of preschool already fluent in English and Spanish and could read both languages. And so they skipped me for first grade. What Brownsville had was the same practice that, that was current uh, in the 50s in all of Texas, which is if you were Spanish speaking, they would put you in low first and then you would be promoted to high first, and then low second, and then high, all the way to sixth grade, which meant you could be 12 years in school and still be only in the sixth grade. And, a lot, and it caused a lot of dropouts, and it happened to my uncles, that, that one uncle got uh, uh, recruited, well, drafted, out of the sixth grade, because he was already of draft eligible age. Um, I, I was one of those exceptions that, that didn't have to go through that system. I skipped first and went straight to second. Um, my next school was NES Putnat, uh, which Putnat, by the way, is, is a bad word to say it in Spanish. It, it, it's a cuss word, but it's a beautiful word when it's a lovely school. Um, NES Putnat was one of the highest poverty schools in the country. Uh, in fact, we use it as an example in the Texas school finance case filed in the Austin's, um, Austin uh, state courts. Uh, NES Putnat, when it rained outside, it rained inside. Uh, we had no playground for, for the children to get a recess. What they did is they pulled out police barricades and closed up a street. And let me tell you, playing softball on a pavement uh, 
if if you're dressed correctly, you know, with padding is okay. But if you're if you're wearing a dress, it's not a good recess. Um, NES Putinet um, was where I was first tested under standardized tests, and I was in fifth grade reading at the high school senior level. So I skipped sixth grade. So I went to sixth grade for one year at Canales. Not one year, one week. They, they read my school records and said that I already knew what sixth grade was about. So I went straight to junior high, from fifth grade to junior high. I was the shortest kid in school. Everybody was wearing, you know, uh, hose, and I was still wearing little, little stock, stockings. And, um, but, but everyone treated, I wasn't bullied. Everyone treated me really well because I was kind of like the pet of the, of the seventh graders, the, 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 the littlest one, the one, the one that, uh, that stood out. Um, I went to Brownsville High. Uh, that was, now that was a dramatic uh, situation because the, the, the tax base couldn't support enough high schools for all the kids in Brownsville. Brownsville is about 90% Latino. And the, being a high agricultural base, we just didn't have anything expensive to tax. I mean, we didn't have you know, huge shopping centers like, like some of the urban centers of Texas. So Brownsville could afford one high school and they planned a high school that could hold 2,500 students. Well, 5,000 enrolled. And uh, we went on, on double shifts with seniors in the morning and uh, freshmen in the, in the afternoon. Um, I went through a normal four-year uh, high school, as normal as it could be if you're 16 years old and you're a high school senior. Um, I was in UIL uh, starting in the eighth grade, and I was a spelling champion, regional spelling champion for four years five years. Um, came up to Austin my first time when I was in high school at representing South Texas. And didn't win state, but uh, got to see the University of Texas at Austin and got to see the state capitol. Uh, before that, the farthest I'd ever traveled was to see relatives either in Corpus or Dallas. And um, this was my first university that I'd visited. So while you were attending these schools, were you aware of, at a young age, of these like discrepancies of like you know the high school being underfunded and like overcrowded? I was aware that education was important, and so I accepted the the quality of the education. I I wasn't aware until I left the valley about how huge the discrepancies were. Um, when I finished at 16, I, I applied only to community college because I could not afford to go away and stay in a dorm or anything like that. I'm the oldest of six kids, so a, a college education was prohibitive uh, in terms of cost. Uh, but I did uh, get a Rotary Club scholarship, and that paid all of my tuition uh, for, for Texas Southmost College. Um, Texas Southmost College was uh, the only place uh, that I knew. I, didn't, I had never been on a four-year campus before, except for when I would go off to UIL. Um, Texas Southmost College um, had um, agreed with the city of Brownsville to host the public library, and that's why I had been on that campus. The city d could not afford its own freestanding library. They were going through budget crises throughout. And so I would go on that campus, and I started reading in the children's section, and then moved on and was reading high school and college books from the, the community college. I transferred credits over to Edinburgh, uh, which is Pan American University at Edinburgh, and um, took f more than full loads. Uh, I was taking 21 hours per semester sometimes, and took full loads in the summer. And so I finished college from freshman to senior year in two and a half years. And so I was 19. Um, um, I had done my student teaching when I was 18 and uh, w had a double major, English and government, and uh, a minor in education. So my first job was as a public school teacher, and I was 19 years old, back at that same overcrowded high school at Brownsville High. And the way I got that job was uh, Edinburgh played Brownsville at a football game, and I went to see my students play and ran into the superintendent of schools who remembered me as a student. And he said, what are you doing when you graduate? And I said, I'm going to be a teacher. And he said, I've got a job for you. So as a 19-year-old, I was a ninth grade teacher. Uh, and it had only been two and a half years since I had been a high school student myself. And it was a, it was a great experience because 
I became then, now having seen what a college looked like and seeing what our high school was like, then I realized we were severely overcrowded at our high school. The building was not at all adequate for the number of students it had to host. And it was a crazy schedule for a teacher to have to teach six classes in a row without a break. But that's how we had to do it because we were doing split shifts. You had to teach your six, get out of the way, because another teacher needed your classroom when you were done to teach her six. Kind of going back to your um, family, as the oldest of six children, did you ever feel a personal responsibility to kind of lead by example and get your education? Well, my brother and I were buds, so we both wanted to set good examples. So we, we, we um, went through something that, that is unusual. The 60s affected us uh, with women's liberation and with civil rights. My mom decided that she was going to go back to school. And she had finished high school, so she thought it was time to go to college. And so in the 60s, my brother and I would stay home and watch the younger kids. Uh, and my mother would take a couple of courses every semester. It took her a long time to graduate, but she earned her BA, and then she kept going to school and earned her master's as well. Um, so, so uh, yes, because we were helping with the babysitting and, and after school care, yeah, we, we had to be the examples. Did um, your mom influence or just your family influence your decision um, to go back into teaching? My, my, both my parents thought that teaching was appropriate for a girl. So even though the 60s were happening, they thought that the only career for girls was, was, was teaching. Um, the, my, my dad and my mom uh, really resisted my going to law school because first they knew that it meant that I would have to leave the valley. The only graduate schools, the only, the only career or professional schools in the valley were for teaching. We did not have a medical school, a law school, an engineering school, a, a communication school. We didn't have that in the valley uh, when, when I was looking at college. Um, I was able to persuade my parents that I needed to go to college, that I had a full scholarship, and, and they, they agreed to let me go to Pan Am, and I stayed in the dorms for one year um, and finished my last year of, of my college. And then I persuaded my parents that I needed to go to law school. And I, I, even though I was a teenager, and it was a, a, it was a burden for my parents. The, I, I had applied to schools that were expensive, both public and private. Uh, Harvard gave me a full ride. Um, I had to sign up uh, for financial aid and apply for a lot of scholarships. My father had to open a banking account. He had lived paycheck to paycheck all his life. And for the first time in his life, he needed to guarantee that I would pay off my loans because I was still a teenager. Um, so one of the happiest days in his life was when I turned 21 and they took him off as a co-signer on all my loans and debt. Uh, I say all my loans and debt, the, the financial aid was so good that after finishing college and finishing law school, I only owed $5,000 for all that education. I think I, it was a great bargain. So did you know anyone who went to college or graduate school outside of Brownsville? No. No, I mean, my, my uncle was the only one in the family who left, um, and, and he, he, he had a very difficult time. He came to UT when the sniper uh, problem, the, the, the tragedy of the sniper happened on our campus, and he told us about it, and after he went, there, there was more than a, a decade where no one in our family left the valley. Uh, so after him, I was the first one to leave the valley. Um, it was... Um, the perception of parents that if their children left the, the border area to attend school that they either wouldn't come back at all or if they came back they were so changed uh, that, that it was disruptive for the, the family uh, structure. And, and that, that was true not only of folk who left to go to college but we sent many Latinos uh, to serve in the military and many did not come back, and many came back very changed. What um, influenced your decision to go to law school? I had wanted to go to law school since NES Putnam Elementary School. I would walk home from school every day past the, uh, the state courthouse. And even though my parents said, don't go into any buildings, we, of course I would go into the air-conditioned buildings. And so it was 100 degrees outside, but inside the courthouse, there were cool tile floors and there was air conditioning and cold water at the water fountains. And 
people were dressed up in nice suits and nice clothes. And so I thought, I would like to work in this place. I would like to be a lawyer. So I was, I was maybe 10 or 11, and I already knew what I wanted to do. So why Harvard? I applied to five different campuses, and Harvard offered me the best financial aid package. Um, my folks were worried about my being in, in, in Boston and, and were afraid for me, and, and I respect that. But they made it the wild decision that they were going to deliver me. My dad was a delivery man. He first he worked for the dairy, and then he worked for the post office. So he was going to deliver me to Boston. So he put my mom and six kids in a station wagon and drove all the way from Brownsville to Boston, which is more than 1,500 miles. They unloaded my suitcases, gave me big abrazos, turned around and drove back home again. Did you know anything about Harvard before you went? I had, I had um, joined a club at, at Pan Am uh, called the Pre-Law Society, and our, our faculty sponsors had us do research to find out about graduate schools. So we, we, we knew about the LSAT, but we couldn't take an LSAT prep course because there was not one offered. Uh, in the valley, and um, but we did do practice exams, and, and as I read about law schools, I, I, I saw that they were ranked by reputation and that they were very competitive and hard to get into, but um, I got in. Was there a large population of Hispanics at Harvard? Mm -hmm. Oh, not at all. The first Hispanic um, was two years before me, and the first Latina was one year before me. So, so I was part of the first three years that Latinos were, were attending Harvard Law School. I was the first Tejana at Harvard Law School. Um, and um, women didn't, uh, uh, weren't enrolled at Harvard Law School. They, they were supposed to go to Wellesley and not, not attend Harvard undergrad. Uh, so Harvard was sex segregated for a while. Um, the first women to enroll at Harvard Law School were in 1954 which is 40 years after UT admitted women. UT law admitted women in the 1900s. So after Harvard, did you stay in Texas? Or did you come back to Texas? I looked everywhere thinking of what, what would be the best place to go. And I was drawn back to family and I was drawn back to Texas. So my first job was working at the Texas Attorney General's office in the Consumer Protection Division. I was always interested in public interest, so I thought that I could help people who had been defrauded or who had lost their life savings in some way. The uh, time was politically active in the 70s, and Richards was governor. She had an interest in protecting the elderly who had been defrauded. So I, I, I was added to the att Attorney General's Nursing Home Task Force. So an, a typical day would start at midnight. We would meet at a Denny's, uh, divide up the questions and interviews that we were going to conduct, go to a nursing home, interview the staff and the patients, and, and we found some horrendous examples of, of abuse of the elderly. Unfortunately, the court system that existed in the 70s only gave us a legal remedy. So if the chief lawyer was successful in winning a case, the nursing home would be closed. So, so we were making things worse instead of better. Instead of taking care of the elderly, we were making them homeless. So Ann Richards and her political team got the legislature to change it so that nursing homes that were defrauding folk could be put under receivership, which meant that the management would be evicted, not the, not the patients at the home, not the residents. Um, the important lesson I learned was having legal experience was not enough. You needed to also somehow acquire political experience and so I, I learned to make ties with our elected official and to keep them involved in, in any of the public interest issues that I was working on. And I did that all my life. It couldn't be just the lawyers. You needed to have ties to community and you needed to have ties to the electeds. So a couple of years after um, working as a lawyer, you joined the MALDEF team. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what led you to join MALDEF? I was married at the time and my husband got a job in San Antonio and I looked for something that I would find fulfilling, and there was a job opening to work with young kids to be an education lawyer. And I thought, great, I won't be working with the elderly anymore because that was just extremely difficult to do. And so I started working uh, where my clients would be kids. And we worked on school desegregation cases, bilingual education cases, uh, access to gifted and talented. And I also did sex discrimination work. There was a Chicana rights project 
that I was assigned to. And we worked on uh, opening up vocational training uh, and, and access to jobs. Uh, one of our lawsuits was against the city of San Antonio to uh, uh, require that they allow women to be trained as bus drivers. And the weird thing is that after we won that and settled that case, my car got pushed over by a big bus, and I got out of the car to find out who was driving the bus, and it was a Latina, and I just smiled. It was an inappropriate response, but I was just really happy that one of the products of the, of the suit was uh, that my car got shoved over. It didn't get damaged, so I didn't file a suit because of, of something I caused. Um, so by the time you started working as a lawyer for Maldiff, you were about 24 years old? Yes. Did you ever feel too young or unqualified to be doing this? Oh, I was a baby lawyer. You know, we, we call people in their 20s who, now that I'm not in my 20s anymore, we call everybody in their 20s, we call them baby lawyers. And baby lawyers are folk that um, um, are new but, but are, are hardworking and, ver and very eager to try anything. So I tried everything. I mean, I got added to um, cases that are now, now they're famous cases, but I didn't know that at the time. So I was a baby lawyer on the team that handled Plyler versus Doe, which is a case representing undocumented children who were being told by Texas that they were not Texas residents because their parents had brought them over when they were babies. And uh, that case went to the Supreme Court and Texas lost that case. Texas tried to argue that they had um, uh, a, a, a rational justification, uh, an economic justification to exclude the children. And the Supreme Court said it will cost the state much more money to keep the children uneducated and to let them be unemployed and in the streets than to provide them a public education. So the Supreme Court ordered the state of Texas to provide public education to undocumented children. So, um I kind of want to ask a question about Maldives higher education case. So overall, before we go into more detail, can you tell me what your role was in that case? I was um, part of a, of a co-counsel team. Al Kaufman and I were co-counsel. We uh, partnered up with Texas Rural Legal Aid, and they provided us uh, local counsel. Uh, so we were five lawyers, one from the Maldives office, the Mexican American Legal Defense Office in California, and Al and I were from the San Antonio Regional Office. Al and I divided up the client group by region, so I drew El Paso and Alpine, Del Rio, and Uvalde, and Al got San Antonio. Now, I don't think that's a fair def dis d division of labor, but I must have missed a meeting where the, where the assignments were made. It turned out I made great friends in, in the West Texas and Panhandle area, and uh, folk, folk like, um, 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 Rosie Castro kept an, had contacts to the border, and Rosie Castro is the very famous woman who um, was a co-founder of the Raza Unida Party and worked for Southwest Voter Registration Project. And her son, one of her sons, is a congressman, and the other son is former former cabinet um, uh, secretary. Rosie Castro was involved as as part of the client group that helped us. Um, locate um, potential witnesses and potential supporters. So how did Maldiv decide to represent LULAC and others on this case? Well, Maldiv had already had enormous success due to Al Kaufman's work in the, in the public school finance cases. And, and when Al filed that case, he was representing school superintendents. So he wasn't actually representing children directly, he was representing entire school districts. And, and he had talked with uh, experts in higher education, like Dr. Jaime Chain, um, who, who understood that the funding um, um, for higher education was even more disproportionate than the funding for public schools. And what Dr. Chain said is, keep an eye on the legislature. They have uh, appropriated funds to have a neutral accounting firm collect data about the Texas funding scheme for higher ed. And sure enough, the state of Texas hired Coopers and Librand, uh, which is now called Coopers and Librand and Water Price, Waterhouse Price. So it's a major accounting firm. And they, they collected data uh, in the 80s about Texas's funding. So what, what they con concluded was that Texas spent more money on the affluent part of the state and the least amount of money on the highest poverty uh, uh, population in the state. 
and that the funding followed the wealthy rather than following the, the students in need. And the conclusion was that the Texas funding system was irrational. Now, irrational is an important term because in order for a state to ever win or defend themselves in a suit brought by Latinos, they must show that they are behaving objectively and in not, not in a arbitrary and capricious and ir irrational way. Irrational is a nice way of saying crazy. And a, a very prestigious national accounting firm described this entire state of Texas scheme as crazy. Which, which made, prompted the, the, the Latino legislators to ask the state to take a look at responding to that, and there was no response. There was no response. Further, um, the state had been investigated for uh, segregation in higher education by the U.S. Department of Justice. The Department of Justice was forced in a lawsuit called Adams versus Bell to quit investigating and, and either decide to settle it or decide to, to let them go or decide to push it. Well, they couldn't let them go because they found discrimination. So they had to either settle it or, or, or bring them into court and let the judge order a remedy. Well, they settled it. And in the settlement, the state agreed to strengthen the historic black colleges and to collect data and, and identify um, uh, underrepresentation of Latinos and African Americans in enrollments. So s the state settled, wrote a five-year plan. At the end of the third year, said we're not going to make the fourth or fifth year. We're not. We're just not going to be able to close the gaps. We, we're not going to do it. Don't don't tell us to. We can't do it. And they gave up. So th the combination of the state admitting that they're not going to close the gap, and the accounting firm saying. It's worse in higher ed than it was in public ed. It's, it's irrational in terms of the funding, is what prompted Maldiv to, to contact its clients and say, you know, this is a lawsuit that needs to be brought. Did you feel um, emotionally invested in this case with, you know, the time you grew up in the I, I, Yes. I mean, I, I would like to say I'm completely unbiased, but I'm just going to disclose that, yes, I've got a personal interest. In, in, being, in seeing that my neighbors and people I grew up with are treated fairly. Um, NES Putinat, the school that I said rained indoors is when, it, when it rained outdoors, um, that was one of the schools that we presented in the, in the school finance case in the, for, for public schools. Um, Texas, uh, the, the Pan American University where I, where I received my degree was a school that I wanted to use as an example of what happens when a school is underfunded. Um, I told you I didn't notice the difference in quality until I left the, the South Texas area. Pan Am had so little resources that at noon on Friday they would tell the librarians to go home and they would close the library on the weekends. They couldn't afford to, to, to keep the library open on weekends, uh, which is when most working students and students in general catch up is you do that Sunday afternoon, evening run to the library to get ready for the week. We, didn't, we couldn't do that. We couldn't afford to do that. Harvard Law School, on the other hand, had three law libraries, a full one for the students, a separate one for the faculty, and a separate one for the student organizations. So to go from a place that had no library at all to attend a place where they had three, and they, those were open 24 hours a day, made me aware that there was a big gap between what private schools were doing and public schools. Then I finally visited other campuses as part of the investigation and realized that the, the conditions and the quality of, of funding was much, much lower in the border area. So can you talk about the work that went into filing the case? I know it's, it's probably a bit more complicated. Um, so did you have to present any type of evidence, things like that? Mm -hmm. So we did the legal research first. We wanted to see if the same constitutional, state constitutional principles that were used in the Edgewood case could also be extended to higher education. We found an interesting case back in the 1800s where um, the, the courts ruled that, that, that equitable funding should be made available. So we thought, okay, we've got legal precedent. It's old, but it's never been overturned, so it's, it's, it's law, it's, it's Texas law. Um, we found uh, information in the Constitution that the state shall provide for, for um, 
uh, for the maintenance of public education, and they didn't say, but not higher education. So we, 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 we said, if it doesn't exclude it, then it should be applied to, to the entire spectrum of education. And then we also looked to see how other states' constitutions read, and we found that in other states, uh, public education was a fundamental right, and that included higher education, and that was true in California and other, other states in the Southwest. So having done the legal research then, we proceeded to figure out, well, what are the facts? And what we saw was we needed to define the group of clients, and so we called it the border initiative. And, and that, ha that was because various administrators uh, over several decades had aligned themselves and organized themselves as, as border campuses. So from El Paso through Laredo down to Brownsville, that, was, that would be the border. We collected data particularly focusing on graduate opportunities because we were concerned about professional schools. And if you looked at master's pr degrees, um, about 4% of the funding for master's degrees that came from the state of Texas, the funding, state funding, uh, went to the border area. And the border area was 25% of the state population. If you looked at the professional degrees, like engineering schools, law schools, and medical schools, 1% went to the border region where fourth of the people of the state resided. So the discrepancies were, were, were impressive. The, the sound bites were clear. You can't be 25% of the state and get 1% of the state funding. That, that's causing the people with the lowest resources to have to travel the farthest. So the sound bites were, were understandable by chambers of commerce, by Latino organizations, and by, by um, local business people who, who shared an interest with, with the, the Latino civil rights folk. So as you were learning more um, and gathering evidence for this case, how did this play a role in understanding your own educational experience? Well, I was trying to get to the history to find out whether it was by happenstance or accident that the border area was short funded. And the more I interviewed, the more folk I interviewed and the more records I found, uh, I was shocked that, that there were racial overtones to the allocation of funds. Um, the other flagship, not UT, the other flagship had the largest collection of Confederate and uh, uh, memorabilia at a, their public library. Well, why was that? What was that going on? I mean, what, what signal did that send to the students of color? Um, the um, pictures and videos that were used for recruitment um, of students did not, did not show anyone of color. In fact, one of them was kind of comical. I mean, there would be these white students all happy and smiling, and then the Latino gardener in the back with his leaf blower was walking in the background. Uh, you know, so, so their communication of, of what people's roles on their campus should be uh, was sending a message of, you don't belong here. Um, the the um, minutes of the coordinating board showed requests from the border for master's programs and for doctoral programs, all denied. Uh, the minutes showed programs that would, were desperately needed in the border were being approved in the non-border areas. So for example, the highest diabetes in the state, the highest rates of diabetes are occurring among Latinos and who are on the border, but the first uh, podiatry school, which is because if, you, if your diabetes gets advanced, you're going to have your feet either, either have surgery on them or, or amputated if, it, if it's advanced cases. Well, Texas Tech got a podiatry school. Um, the, the bilingual programs, the masters and the PhD, were, had doctoral programs in Austin and in Texas Tech and Lubbock, but there wasn't a PhD bilingual education program, and the, the greatest numbers of kids who, uh, who needed bilingual ed teachers were in the border area. So we, we, had, we had hundreds of examples of requests made by administrators from the border, all denied. Uh, and again, it, it, it appeared to be irrational because they could not justify. They didn't say, no one in Texas needs it. What they said, no one in the border needs it. And, our, and, and a separate group of, of, of plaintiffs joined the case and they wanted a law school because the closest public law school was Austin. And they wanted a law school in the border area. 
and they were so committed to the cause that they petitioned the, the, uh, the Supreme Court to give them a provisional approval to try setting up their own without state funding, just a private school. And these students that attended the private school, of the eight who were in the first class, six passed the state bar. I think it was six. But, the, but more than half passed the bar while they were working full time and essentially teaching themselves because they were trying to create a school while they were studying for the bar. And uh, the fact that they passed showed that the quality was there, that the need was there, and yet we had, we had no, no law school for them either. So what was the state arguing? Okay, so the, the Texas Attorney General's office argued that, that the Constitution um, uh, did not include higher education as a fundamental right and that that old case in the 1800s no longer had any legal um, uh, standing anymore, that it should be reversed, that it shouldn't be accepted. Uh, they further argued that um, they, didn't, they didn't think that there was any, any racial reason for uh, all those rejections of requests, uh, that, that, that um, the requests, um, in their opinion, were not as strong as requests from other parts of the state. Um, now that, that that's where success ga gathers more success. If you've always been Texas Tech and always been getting programs, it's easier to get more programs. Um, in fact, the, the funding is, is, was the same problem for higher ed. You needed to be able to support a program for two years on your own and show that you had your own resources before any state funds could be received. Uh, but that is not really a neutral practice because it, it, it dis disproportionately excluded a low income areas from being able to start up programs. So, so the state's argument was you're poor so you, you can't start up your own programs on yourself therefore we're not going to provide you any state support and um, that um, you can't prove that it's, it's discriminatory. Uh, one of our chief witnesses to rebut the uh, discriminatory argument was Dr. Joaquin Cigarroa who is a physician with a, with a Harvard medical degree and he's um, uh, based in Laredo and he testified that when he was a young man in his 30s he served on a state uh, advisory board on higher education and that he put, to put together a very sound package proposing uh, adding um, um, funds to Laredo because Laredo was, was um, a, a, a very talented area. I mean, he came from there and he was accepted to Harvard, so there's some talented people there, right? Well, well, he, he argued that Laredo needed funding for a building because when what happened is when students finished high school in Laredo, the, the college rented classrooms from the high school, so you took your college classes in the same high school you just graduated from. And, and, that, and, and that was one of the, the, the sharpest examples of, of a lack of state support. Uh, they, they, they didn't provide any funding to even have separate buildings for, for college from high school. Um, he was told by the head of the advisory committee that it would be the, the greatest crime to send money to those kids in Laredo. So, so he, he, he was rebuffed in, in, in a blanket no, that, that no one in that part of the state uh, deserved higher education or state support for higher education. And he took that to be a racially motivated statement. So this case became a class action case. Um, can you explain what that means and why Maldiff wanted this to be a class action case? But all of our education cases have a particular challenge built into them. The students can age out. The suits are not resolved in weeks or months. They, they take years. And so when you bring a, a, a suit where you rep your clients or, or students, you want to be sure that you have a wide enough representation that you still have clients when the suit is finally reaching its, its completion. So a class action is made possible if you can show that you have numerosity, you know, a large number of folk, that you have typical representatives, folk who, who, who have the same kinds of issues, and, and that the issues are, are held in common with all of the members of the class. So from the border area, from El Paso down to Brownsville, we were able to show that they experienced the same deprivation of state funding, the same lack of facilities, the same lack of opportunities for graduate education, and the unfair burden of having to travel the farthest uh, to attend education. 
Um, so you touched on this a little bit before, but can you um, go into a bit more detail about type of evidence that was presented in the case, um, like in the courtroom? So this was a jury trial. And uh, after picking a jury, it, it becomes 90% Latino. We had a 100% Latino jury. The state had a Latino male uh, arguing for them, and so it was Norma and uh, Mr. Aguilar. Uh, uh, Al, Al Kaufman uh, has an undergraduate degree from MIT, and so he was our quantitative person. He was able to put together the experts to, to break through the financial uh, data and, and present it clearly enough that a juror d would not need a, a, a degree in accounting to be able to understand it. But I was the person from the Valley who understood how much these students needed these opportunities. So I put on the witnesses who, who talked about how harmful this was. And I talked about the educational harm and put on witnesses to present facts. And the facts were that, that the current um, uh, college presidents were very frustrated because they had been requesting and pursuing and trying to add programs and they could not see any rationale, any non-discriminatory reason for why they were con consistently rejected. They couldn't bring a suit against themselves. You know, a college president can't sue his own university. Uh, uh, so, so I think that they were kind of relieved that a third group came in to, to create an opportunity for them to talk about what it felt like to, to ask in a rational way for state support and to be denied in an irrational way. Um, so the evidence presented um, uh, qual qualitative information with testimony by students. Uh, one of our clients um, was a member of a student organization called Mecha, and he testified about um, being bullied at, at one of the pr predominantly white campuses and how students would, would beat him up and how difficult it was um, to attend school outside of the border area. Well, that wasn't happening in, in his hometown of Corpus, that it was happening when he left the border area. Um, so we put on the presentation of, of how it harmed individuals, how it harmed um, the campuses in terms of being competitive, and how it harmed the whole region economically. So our, we had experts testify that uh, graduate programs are an economic driver, that for every $1 spent in a master's program, it generates $4 locally because businesses uh, seek advice and seek research information from master's programs. And professional schools, I think it was like $36 for every $1 invested, that the economy rose that high by having an investment of higher education expertise in the local area. So, so presidents of chambers of commerce. And then our favorite witness, of course, was Mayor Henry Cisneros, because he understood both sides. He understood the side of being someone who grew up in, 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 in South Texas. He understood why the border was particularly challenged by this problem of a lack of higher education opportunity and he saw the financial uh, and economic potential that this lawsuit could bring. So the jury was unable to reach a verdict on the case, but a judge did issue <laughs> a judgment. So was that judgment the same or equivalent to a final verdict, or um, did it hold less weight? The jury could not reach a question uh, of, they were not able to say that they, they knew that there had been racial motivation. But they did know that the Constitution had been violated. They did rule as a, as a unanimously that, that the, the students, the plaintiffs, were denied their constitutional rights to have access to higher education. But they couldn't say that it was racially motivated. Fortunately, we didn't need to show that it was racially motivated in order to prevail. We had a constitutional. The, 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 the Texas school finance case, for example, was not decided on the basis of race discrimination. It was based on the denial of your, of your constitutional right to have access to public education. So you, we were using the same constitutional, state constitutional arguments. Now, what happened on appeal was um, a marvelous story. And several people have written their dissertations, and, and there's been a couple of books out already. So what happened is the legislature stepped in 
having had the problem sharply defined by a judge who ruled that the system was unconstitutional, the legislature reacted by saying, before it hits the Supreme Court, let's address it. And remember, Ann Richards was still governor, and Ann Richards always looked out for the underdog, and she wanted to be sure that all Texans uh, were heard. So that what the legislature did is they, they um, um, asked for a settlement proposal to come from the border region. Now, before this lawsuit, the border really wasn't a unified border. El Paso looked out for El Paso, Laredo looked out for Laredo, Kingsville and Brownsville, you know, didn't talk to each other. But this lawsuit um, prompted everyone to, to agree that they would come up with a proposal and El Paso would support San Antonio's request and San Antonio would re support Laredo's request. And so a fourth of the legislature submitted a proposal. Um, and it was a significant uh, uh, alliance. Also, it was not just Latinos. Even though the organization that led the case was the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, the chambers of commerce were very diverse. One, one of my, my folk that testified to the legislature was a rancher, big old six foot two, redheaded guy, you know, belt buckle the size of a, of a hubcap, and cowboy boots and all, he marched in there and said, you're hurting the border, you're hurting our economy, you can fix this, you have an opportunity to strengthen the state of Texas. And so they were listening to it, not just as a civil rights issue for Latinos, they were listening to it as a serious economic problem for the state of Texas that, that we had short-funded the border area. Um, so the legislature responded by approving startup monies. These would be additional funds to help the border area expand its offering of programs. So the startup money grand total that both the Senate and the House approved was $660 million. Two thirds of a billion dollars in 1981 is a lot of money. I mean, that's a lot of zeros. And the legislature approved it it went to the governor, and Richard signed it, and that became the, 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 the new fund to support the border initiative. Then the Supreme Court argument happened, and the Supreme Court says, why are you here? You've got $660 million. What are you complaining about? And then they said, and you're using 1800 law passed, you know, before the 1900s. What are you, why are you here? And we did our best argument we could make, but it really was true. The facts had changed dramatically. And so we lost. The Supreme Court ruled that they no longer applied the law that was before. They reversed themselves. They, they, they pulled the, the law from under our feet. But they also noted, look at the fantastic job the legislature has done in responding to, to uh, the need on the border. So my clients were not sad. They said, any time I can lose a lawsuit and come ahead, $660 million is, is a day to celebrate. And um, what has happened since that ruling uh, is that the funds were used to start up master's degree programs. Uh, the border now has engineering, has a medical school, uh, has um, um, broad professional schools that, that it didn't have before. Uh, they opened a building for Laredo because Texas A&M partnered up with Laredo and they have a, a beautiful campus with, with wonderful medical school opportunities. They don't have their uh, freestanding medical school, but they, can, they, they, they have professional op op offerings that they didn't have before. The Rio Grande Valley got a medical school, got, got um, funding to provide PhD programs. Um, Alpine, Sul Ross, uh, El Paso, I mean, all the parts of the border, Corpus, all parts of the border used the money really well. And, and as I said, the economy built on that, you know, really built on that. So I know that um, the reversal of the judgment by the Supreme Court didn't feel so much like a crushing defeat, but did that signify anything to you, just about um, maybe the law just would never be on your side? Well, it, it, is, it is an important lesson um, that, that I've always followed is to see if you could file a lawsuit 
that would, would be incremental. That, that to not look at a single case as the, the, the full solution to, to a, 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 an economic and constitutional problem. So, so it incrementally, it, it, it was successful because it, it, it did get the legislature's attention. I've been asked, you know, what's the legacy of the, of the case? And one of the legacies of the case is that um, if there ever is a constitutional convention, we need to fix that court's ruling and be sure that higher ed is part of, of the constitutional protections that the Texas Constitution covers. So that's one of the lessons I'm drawing from it. The other lesson I'm drawing from it is that now that we have shown that the border has been using its higher education opportunities well, we need to fight to protect it because there is a threat in this legislative session uh, to reduce higher education funding. Uh, initially, the, the governor's proposal was a 10% cut to higher education. They're still talking about a 6% cut to higher education. Uh, that translates into lost opportunities for millions of students in Texas. And uh, we, we can't go backwards. We know what, what harm we've already seen before in the 80s uh, to the border if there are education and higher education cuts. We can't go backwards. So, so the lessons are, are that our, our, our Constitution, if they're going to change it in one way, they need to change it to improve it for all Texans. But also, if the legislature is making budget cuts, they need to be rational. And rational means not putting the burden of the cuts uh, disproportionately on the shoulders of low-income people. Um, can you tell me what your role was in the South Texas Border Initiative? The, there's, there's, a, there's a border initiative where the experts met. They, that name was used by the educators and the administrators as they did their planning and, and, and gathered data as a group. It was also used as the legislative approach, proposal that became the settlement that Ann Richards signed. So when the planning was happening among the plaintiff groups, uh, I attended the, and uh, Al, Al was the, the convener, and I represented about a half of the client group, so I had my half folk work with each other to come up with proposals that were not duplicative, that weren't wasteful, and to come up with proposals that had the greatest impact for helping the students and helping the economy. So what we were doing is, is coordinating. Al and I were coordinating our, our clients to come up with a proposal that was um, affordable to the state and promised to yield the highest impact in terms of solving the problem but also benefiting the state as a whole. So we didn't want to hurt any of the programs that already existed outside the border, but we wanted an opportunity to grow our own programs too. So um, looking back, how do you feel about the case now? I'm really excited that um, we tried the first higher education funding uh, uh, case. Uh, that that all of the all all but one of the fifty states have been sued on public uh, school funding, but we tried the first higher education one, and we got it up to the Supreme Court, and we got out of there with with not a positive legal ruling, but we got out there with a positive solution, and and I'm proud of our clients for for. Um, standing up for their rights and standing up for the rights of their children. So I, I think the legacy of, of the case which is called LULAC versus Clements, uh, because it started out with Richards but, but Governor Clements was the last person in the lawsuit, uh, the, legal, um, the legacy of that case is one that uh, the border spoke as a, as a unified voice and they learned uh, to use their power both legally and politically. Um, so of all the cases that you've worked on for MALDEF, which one do you feel the, the proudest about? I think I'm proudest of so many. I mean, I've, I've worked in a small, small role on the voting rights cases. Uh, White versus Register is a case that went to the Texas Supreme Court where the Supreme Court insisted that Latinos also be given access to the right to vote um, and covered Texas by the, um, the Voting Rights Act of 1964. 
Um, I've already mentioned uh, Doe versus Plyler, which is the case that gave uh, school children who were undocumented the right to attend public schools. Um, uh, this, the, the employment cases, I mentioned the ones in the city defending women uh, who could, it, it, unfortunately the, there were waiting lists for training programs and the lower you were educated the farther back you were put in the wait list which is the opposite of what you should do and if you really want to have an impact on poverty. Um, I'm proud of, of the work that Maldif does with the census. Every 10 years, we, we the organization Maldif um, reminds the Latino community that, they're, that they count in the census and should participate. And um, that's coming up very shortly because we're, we're, we're halfway through 17, so the census is coming in a couple of years. Um, the, the, the Adams versus Bell is an interesting one. I mentioned that. It's a case where the uh, Department of HEW was sued because Congress passed a law and the agency refused to issue regulations. And the court ruled that federal agencies, when authorized by Congress, must do their job. They must do what Congress ordered them to do because they're the administrators of those laws. And it was a case where the politics were that the agency didn't want to do something that they thought would be controversial, so they just, they just delayed and delayed and delayed. The federal courts provides check and balances on the federal government. And that's a good example where today we should be aware of how important the courts are because if agencies refuse to serve the people that they're intended to serve, the federal courts could order them to do it. And so it matters hugely who the judges are and it matters very much that the heads of agencies do their job. So I have some questions here um, from my peers about things that you've talked about. Um, so the first question, how many testimonies were um, in the case and how did the state react to the testimonies? Oh my gosh, all of the college presidents testified either in person or, or by deposition. So we've got 36 four-year universities and maybe half of the community colleges, so another 40 of, of the, of the two-year two and then we had another two or three dozen um, students and parents. So more than 50. How did the state react to those testimonies? The state um, wouldn't cross-examine them very hard because a lot of them were their own employees. I mean, we were using the state's own information against the state. So the state had a difficult time with the cross-examination. And no one can cross-examine Dr. Henry Cisneros. I mean, he's, he was just unshakable. Uh, he he, he um, uh, continued to insist that it was not an accident that the state had short-funded, that it was completely intentional, uh, that it could not have happened by coincidence, that su such so little funding, 1% when you are a fourth of the population, to him was a very damning figure. Um, Dr. Cigaroa, because he personally was in the room when the discrimination happened, was a powerful witness, and he couldn't be shaken either. Um, the, 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 the weakness in, was not in the testimony. The weakness was that there weren't very many records. People don't write down, today I will discriminate against Mexican-Americans. So we don't, we don't have a paper trail, but that hardly ever exists. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you visited UT Austin um, in high school during UIL, what were your first impressions? <laughs> well, it, it, it was a, it, I'm a high school student and I'm in Austin and I'm coming from a very uh, conservative, very um, um, rigid kind of background. I mean, I, I went to, I went to um, Catholic um, uh, classes, commu uh, after communion classes, and so, so you know, I, I come to Austin and people are not wearing enough clothes, they look like hippies. Well, well, yeah, it was the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. There were protests going on about the Vietnam War. So I arrived during a demonstration uh, and saw people marching on the Capitol. I saw the Texas Ranger sitting at the Capitol door on a rocking chair with a, a big rifle in his lap guarding the Texas ha Capitol so those hippies wouldn't come in. 
So it, it was a, a very historic time. I think I, I, now I would say I felt like Forrest Gump. You know, I, I felt like I was in a point of history. I just didn't understand it until now when I got older, I realized I showed up at a time where um, college students were using their voices and making themselves heard and, and standing up against what they thought was an unfair war, an unjust war. And Aust Austin was, was uh, to me, a very noisy place because there were protests and crowds and marches. Um, the, the valley was a big contrast. I mean, the valley accepted that, that our soldiers would go and fight the war and many of them die and, and not, not be rewarded or honored the way they should be. Um, but Austin students didn't accept that, that that wasn't right, and they were going to speak up against it and protest it loudly and as, as much as they could. Along those same lines, um, what was the political climate like when you went to Harvard? I got there uh, the year before the Bakke decision was, was uh, released by the Supreme Court. So Harvard was trying really hard to serve as an example of, of diversity. And they were, they were um, very committed to being a good example for the Supreme Court to, to use uh, of, of how it could, they could attract people who would graduate and attract people uh, who needed to be recruited. I mean, I, I, if, if Harvard had not made the effort of, of providing me adequate financial aid, I would not be able to go. It was just it was just as easy as that. So they had to make an effort to get me out there. They couldn't just say, well, you know, just show up, Norma, like all the folk who live in Boston, just show up. I mean, you know, I, I, I needed to be recruited. I needed to have an extra effort, what, what, what LBJ called the affirmative action. I needed that extra step. Did you experience um, any discrimination or pressure as one of the first Latino women at Harvard? Um, I know that that we had to be, uh, we were very conspicuous. I mean, there was only like, there were only three Latinas in my ear, so there were four sections, so there was a whole fourth of the student body that didn't have a Latina in their section. So we were conspicuous. I, it felt like being a token. But on, on the other hand, um, the, um, I did not have any faculty say anything discriminatory. I was told stories by the earlier students uh, that they had a Latino day, that one of the, the faculty um, would, would only call on Latinos on that day because it was a criminal law class and all of the cases had Latino surnames. Uh, so I was told by the students before me that, that they felt that they were discriminated against. Um, but I, I, didn't, I didn't see that, that act of discrimination, except for the absence, except for the lack of Latinos. There were no Latino faculty. Um, and um, Harvard uh, didn't tenure a Latino until recently. So, so that, was a, that was something. The absence of Latinos was an indicator of, of, of not having completed the task of, of being inclusive and diverse. Do you know the name of the first um, Hispanic who went to Harvard? Um, yes, it was David Lopez, and he was class of 1970. Okay. Yeah. And then same for the first Latina? Harvard first time? Latina was Ana Maria Martel, and she was from California, and I graduated in 77, she graduated in 76. Okay. And you mentioned earlier that um, a lot of parents in Brownsville were worried about their children going off to college because it kind of changed things in the family structure. So what type of change did you notice, or like, do you mean by change? Well, the, in order to be understood, um, we, we changed our way of communicating. Our diction was different. Um, in order to be um, accepted, um, we, we had to change how we were dressing. Uh, you know, in Brownsville, you're going to be casual, and you have your chanclas, and you have your, your cotton clothing, and you're in Boston, you know, you've got more of a three-piece look. Um, we, we changed in that our aspirations were much higher. We were not satisfied with, with a job that paid minimum wage. We, we wanted, having seen, having seen what the classmates were getting, we wanted to be able to compete for the higher wage jobs. And, and 
folk who went to undergraduate were not satisfied with coming back to the border and saying, okay, well, I have a BA and I'm done. They wanted, they wanted higher education. And you mentioned earlier about how um, there were just so little resources and the library said at noon, <laughs> the librarians mm -hmm. just have to go home. So that was for, was that in high school or college? That was college. Okay. That was, that was, um, that was a four-year college that had, had an inadequate budget. Let me give you other examples. Okay. The facilities were um, a combination of new buildings in Edinburgh and buildings that, that had been donated from other, other um, the, either the county or, or the, the school district. So, so, so the, the School of Education is, uh, when I attended Pan Am, the School of Education was in a, in a building that had a, a drainage issues. So when it rained, the water flooded the first floor. It, it just kind of tumbled down the stairs and then ran into the floor. Um, the the um, parking situation, my last year, my senior year, I got a car. My dad bought me a car. But I couldn't park at the College of Education because they didn't have enough parking spaces. So you had to leave it at the main campus and then walk across uh, like a four block, quarter mile walk. At, but there was a railroad track between the main campus and the College of Education. So when the train kept running, you'd be late for class because you had to wait at the side of the railroad tracks until the train passed and then you'd be able to get to the college. Um, no air conditioning in the College of Ed. So, and this is the valley where you really need air conditioning. So, so the facility quality was, was, was not as professional or as well-funded as, as, as you'd see in Austin, for example. Um, but the, the, the range of programs, I mean, the range of classes, there just weren't as, that many electives because they didn't have the funds to provide the electives. And the financial aid ran out. I mean, they, 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 they'd have wait lists for students who, who needed grants and needed loans. So those are other examples of, of what, it, what it means to attend a, a, a low-funded. Now, after Pan Am merged with UT Austin, UT Austin had to, the system uh, accepted its responsibility. I mean, it entered into an agreement to make it part of the system. So they accepted their responsibility to, to attend to all those issues. Um, so you kind of mentioned before where students were taking the bar and mm -hmm. teaching themselves. Is that at Ronaldo Garza Law School? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, the the I would love to see someone follow up with those students. I know you're planning to take a trip down to Brownsville. It would be great to to meet the lawyers who were the the original uh, uh, plaintiffs in that case. Uh, Yolanda Garza was their their lead counsel. And it would be really fascinating. They, 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 um, they, they're a real testament to, to the bravery. I mean, the, 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 just, just the grand notion of starting a professional school uh, uh, is, 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 is really exciting. Um, so I guess it's kind of like a closing question. Are you optimistic about the future of higher education funding, specifically for like Latinos and undocumented students? I'm both optimistic and concerned. I'm optimistic because I now know that when you invest in Latinos, we've proven that it's good for the state of Texas. So I know that money got well spent, and I know that it's produced more professionals. And that's, and that's, that's why I'm optimistic. But I'm concerned that the state is facing a, a financial crisis because the price of gasoline isn't today what it used to be some years ago and they're looking for a place to cut. And I think it's entirely a wrong place to cut, either public ed or higher ed. Um, so can you talk about the work you did post MALDEV after you left the organization? Well, I left the organization because I'd been there almost 14 years and I had been um, part of, one of my many jobs was to recruit people to work for the White House. So when Governor Bush won, I recruited Latinos to, to, to join the administration so that we'd have someone who looked like us at the policy table. And uh, when uh, uh, Bill Clinton won, I was recruiting people, and one of my friends said, you should put your name in too. I don't think you're, you're being fairer that we have to leave our families and our good food, and you get to stay back in San Antonio and not, not go to Washington. So I thought that was a valid point, and I sent in a resume, and I, I got called in for an interview. Um, I, I had um, testified 
before Congress before. I had that in my portfolio before, before the job interview. But what I had in my resume was that I had sued the Department of Ed. Uh, in, in that Adams versus Bell case I talked about, the Department of Ed didn't do its regulatory job, so I'd sued them, and I had won against the Department of Ed. So in my job interview, I actually got asked by the Secretary of Education, I see that you've sued us before. Do you have any plans to sue us again? And I said, no, sir, I think I've got that out of my system. I'd, I'd like to have the experience of being on the inside, trying to see what we can do um, to make the Department of Education more, more effective and more responsive. And what I learned from that experience, it is a lot harder to build up a program. It's easy to tear a program down. It's easy to criticize it from the outside. It's easy to say, oh, well, that's not the perfect program. It's a lot harder to, to organize it, to manage it, to, to, to be sure that you've secured the resources to make the program work. And we, we, we went through budget cut time. When I was there, they shut government down three times. Um, that was an incredible waste of money. I mean, they, they, were, they were fighting about welfare reform. They didn't, the Congress didn't want to do welfare reform. And so they shut government down three times. Um, the, the budget cuts came in and we had to uh, make the organization smaller, so we put in hiring freezes and we stopped hiring. All that meant is that people would, would um, have to do the jobs of the folk that had left because the work didn't go away. <laughs> the work kept coming in even though there were fewer people to do it. Um, so some of the lessons I've learned from Washington is that uh, government, government employees are very committed. Uh, there's a stereotype that government people all go home at 5 o'clock. When I got there, I found out that that is by federal law. They're not allowed to, to, to do unpaid overtime. Uh, employees uh, had been abused by, by bosses in the past who told them, you must volunteer to work overtime and I won't pay you. And so I learned that people are really hardworking, but, but they're also being treated fairly and, 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 um, and they're following, following the, the, the rules. And finally, what I learned from being there and working for the White House is that it does make a difference to have someone who looks like you be in the room, uh, to speak for women or to speak for people of color or to speak for low-income folk. I mean, it does make a difference. So when issues of immigration came up, I could tell them I was a co-counsel. Issues of bilingual ed, I could tell them I was a lawyer for that issue. I mean, it does make a difference to be in the room. Um, when one person in, in domestic policy in the White House was talking about, oh, I went to this country where, you know, they, their buildings would, would leak on the inside when it would rain. And I said, NES Putinat, my elementary school, come to South Texas. You know, come see poverty. You don't have to leave the United States to see third world poverty. We have it in the United States. And we, we're going to keep having it if we don't pay attention to it. I mean, LBJ's war on poverty is, is not over.